I'll bet that sound's gonna bring up some extreme nostalgia for a lot of you watching. Hey everyone, Chris here with another filler video. A week late, but that's what happens when you get sick and you can't speak right. Anyways, I know it's technically the 100th filler video since starting Ancient DOS games, so I really should have done something more elaborate, but I really didn't haven't had the time given things going on in reality. So instead, we're just going to take a quick look back at an old DOS program I think practically every DOS user in the 90s had encountered at some point or another. Fractant. As is kind of obvious, Fractant is a fractal generating program, i.e. a program which generates images based off of mathematical equations. But that only explains half of the name, the fract part of it for fractal. The int part refers to integers, as the program was originally developed to do fractal generation using strictly integer math as opposed to floating point, so that it could generate images far faster than typical algorithms of the time, which all relied on floating point math and were horribly slow without dedicated FPU. Even with an FPU, the integer-based approach could still outperform the floating point approach on many systems before Pentium CPUs are even a thing. The original release of the program was back in September of 1988, under the name of Fract386, written by Bert Tyler. But the name would change to Fractant only months later, and as the program evolved, many, many more people would contribute to it, ultimately turning Fractant into the de facto program for fractal generation for most of the 90s, and even some of the 2000s, as it simply outperformed everything else, had a ton of features to take advantage of, and was cheap as free. The last official version, version 20, came out right around the turn of the century, with its relevance slowly dropping away since that time, given the way computing has advanced, and given that DOS really isn't a good way to handle performance-hungry tasks anymore. But I still felt it would be interesting to take a look back to demonstrate some of the program's features, and maybe go over some of the more curious things found with them. And I should stress too that I'm not an expert with fractals by any stretch. And I know only the bare basics of how fractal generation takes place, and don't understand a lot of the more complex math which goes on to make it all work. Now, when you first start the program and go past the initial splash screen, you're greeted with this screen asking you to select a fractal type and video mode. And the first thing you're going to notice when you go to select a video mode is that the list is, um, big. This program supports a ton of dedicated or poorly documented video hardware, which is kind of par for the course back in the late 80s and early 90s before VESA standards were a thing, as many graphics card manufacturers added capabilities which superseded the EGA and VGA limits, but then sometimes failed to document those capabilities or often simply required writing dedicated code to support them. Thus, a lot of those advanced capabilities just went completely untouched by most applications. But yes, all of the standardized CGA, EGA, and VGA modes are here, as well as support for non-standard VGA modes, VESA compliant SVGA modes, and even some less common but still relevant formats like Hercules and Tandy modes. There's also technically high color and true color support, though because the program still primarily operates in the realm of palletized output, those modes don't really look so good. Now, when running in appropriate modes, you're also able to use a palette editor to alter the palette however you want, and can save and load palettes, with a number of palettes being pre-included, some of which have more specialized purposes, others of which are just neat to look at. The program also has the ability to generate fractals directly into RAM using expanded memory, thus allowing you to generate a fractal at any size you want, though if the particular size you want isn't listed, you have to edit the configuration file to add it yourself. The only trick is that, by default, the program is designed exclusively for a 4-3 aspect ratio. So when I tried to render a Mandelbrot fractal to a 1920x1080 image size, yeah, it got kind of stretched horizontally a bit. Now, this isn't technically a wrong thing to do, but it's something you have to compensate for if you're intending to use non-4-3 aspect ratios in this program. As to which fractals the program supports, there's a ton of them. Though, to be fair, a lot of them are simply variations on other fractals, which do things in the math which wouldn't normally be possible through simple numerical adjustments. The Mandelbrot is probably the most recognizable fractal here, and is what's referred to as an escape time fractal, whereby the math involved iterates each pixel through an equation multiple times until the result escapes and the number of iterations determines the color of the pixel. That's why whenever you watch a fractal being generated on a slower computer, the pixels with higher palette indices take longer to plot, as it's taking more iterations and does more time to compute those results. 
The Fractant itself offers some general settings to help alleviate some of the processing burden, with a handful of different generation methods, the ability to turn floating point on and off depending on how good your FPU is compared to the underlying integer based routines, plus you can set the maximum number of iterations to allow, with higher values allowing you to zoom more deeply into a fractal, but of course requiring much more power to generate a final image. Actually, here's a quick comparison of the different generation methods to showcase some of the differences. A guessing is similar to doing multiple passes, but it makes assumptions along the way based on the results it finds to try and speed things up. There's also boundary tracing, which is a really fun algorithm to watch, but not exactly the most practical. Tesserol, which breaks things down into square chunks and makes assumptions based on what it finds, allowing it to go extremely fast, but with more chances for missing fine details and diffusion, which makes no assumptions whatsoever and is probably the slowest method available, but allows you to roughly see what you're going to end up with ahead of time so you can zoom deeper faster, as you don't have to wait for the image to finish generating before you do things like zoom in and out. Every fractal will generally have its own specialized settings as well. For the Mandelbrot, you have four. The real component of the equation, the imaginary components, the type of bailout test being performed, and the actual bailout value. And with the Mandelbrot, adjusting the real component tends to have a horizontal effect on the output, while adjusting the imaginary component has a vertical effect, and as you can see with this spread of results. In fact, a fun thing to do with modern fractal generating software is to animate these numbers to produce an effect in motion, which is something I may do in a video myself someday in the future, as it's something I've actually done once before using Fractant frame by frame for a school project way back in the late 90s. Alas, the only copy of said project which still exists is on a VHS tape, so not exactly the easiest thing for me to digitize anytime soon. The bailout value is what the equation tests against to decide to stop iterating before the iteration limit is reached. Now, setting this too low results in an incorrect appearance, but setting it too high really doesn't make the result any more accurate. It just sort of extends how far out the lowest iteration count reaches visually. Adjusting the kind of bailout test though can make a huge difference in the appearance, as it typically changes the way each sort of segment in the fractal is shaped, most of which kind of have a bit of an extreme look to them. The point though is that fractals end up looking quite a bit different depending on how you set up your initial values and equations, which kind of leads into one of the more unique facets of the program. Another well-known fractal set is the Julia set, which is functionally related to the Mandelbrot set. Thus, one of the specialized features of Fractant is the ability to pull up a special cursor with the spacebar, which you can then place anywhere in the Mandelbrot fractal, to see an automatically updating approximation of what the Julia representation of those coordinates would be, then pressing spacebar again generates the related Julia fractal. This doesn't go vice versa, mind you. If you press spacebar in a Julia fractal, you just go back to the Mandelbrot. But this allows you to dial in Julia fractal values much more precisely than would otherwise be possible using numbers alone to get some really interesting results. Another fun thing you can do once you have a fractal image you really like is see how it looks with color cycling. Now, there's a lot of configuration options for color cycling, allowing you to adjust speed and direction, though it's important to make sure you're using a palette which cycles nicely, otherwise the cycling option may get pretty headache inducing. That said, palette cycling is probably better known in terms of plasma fractals, not to be confused with Perlin noise which is a different algorithm which achieves similar results with plasma fractals instead being what's referred to as a diamond square approach, producing a result which has notable creases and flat edges. But regardless, the results of these fractals were often used as the basis for height maps in 3D landscapes, but once you have a completed plasma fractal and turn the palette cycling on, you get an almost hypnotic sort of result, which I probably burned a solid amount of my youth staring into, for better or worse. This would be a good time to point out that Fractant also supports what's referred to as command sets, whereby you can automatically configure any values in the program you want, short of the video mode, from a list of commands, and then generate the resulting fractal. And just like with the palettes, the program comes with a large number of pre-made command sets, a few of which I'm highlighting here. Now this gets more into the artistic side of fractals, as opposed to the mathematical side, as the point here is to primarily just make something that looks cool without using a single shred of graphics artistry, just pure math. And it's actually extremely impressive what some people are able to come up with using modern fractal tools, where the resulting image is strictly math-based and has no artistic input whatsoever from real-world images. In fact, this is what makes the icons fractals all the more interesting. 
A fractal unfortunately doesn't really help with getting icons fractals generating in more unique and interesting ways, but the two you can do easily enough result in what look like sand dollars, one with three lobes, the other with five, with these fractals being generated based on plotting pixels along a particular equation sequence. So which sequence are these fractals using? This one. Yeah, somehow the bifurcation fractal, which in and of itself is one I quite don't understand, it doesn't look like much, is actually the foundation behind a lot of the more organic fractal generation out there, since it's plotting out a system which starts out extremely predictable, but then for some reason just becomes absolute chaos. Except it's not random. Every time you generate the icons or bifurcation fractals with the same settings, the pixels plotted are the same every single time. In fact, most fractals have no randomness whatsoever, the plasma fractal earlier being one of the very few exceptions. Although I suppose the other exception would be IFS fractals, which stands for Iterated Function System. IFS fractals are just sets of numbers which define coordinate transformations with an element of probability thrown in, leading to random dot images which can look very natural and technically have an infinite level of zoom, yet the actual numbers used to generate them are incredibly simple. I mean, let's single out the fern right here, which looks like it must be really complex, but here are the numbers used to generate it, with each of those four lines being one function. Yeah, all it took was a basic random dot algorithm and those four lines of numbers to produce that fern. It's kind of bonkers when you think about it. And one last fractal I want to highlight because it's always been one I personally find interesting is the Newton fractal. It's based on an iterative equation used to find the roots of polynomial equations, but what's interesting about it visually is that you can effectively set how many degrees of symmetry there are from two or more which in turn leads to that many spokes coming out of each deeper and deeper iteration, which attaches to the rest. You can technically set this value much higher as well, but as it gets larger, everything starts to blend together into circles, and the visual spectacle gets lost along the way. So yeah, that was just a quick look back at the old Fractint program for DOS. If you'd like to grab a copy for yourself to try out, either the DOS or Linux versions, simply head on over to www.fractint.net. There's also technically a .org mirror of the .NET site, but for some reason it wasn't working when I was getting this video together. And I should quickly point out too that there's also a Windows Fractant program, but it was sort of its own thing and never made it beyond being a 16-bit application. Thus, you still have to run it emulated nowadays anyways, or on older pre-64-bit hardware. And I should also mention too that Fractant is a good example of how the DOSBox emulator wasn't really made for applications. I ran into a number of technical issues getting this program working in the standard build of DOSBox, and found switching to more modern builds like DOSBox X sort of helped, but there's definitely some weirdness which can occur and has to be worked around, mainly a result of how this program constantly switches between text mode and your selected video mode. So that's something you need to keep in mind is that you'll have better results using Fractant with emulation if you avoid video mode switching as much as you can. And back on real hardware, this was never an issue. Anyways, that'll be all for this filler. The next Ancient DOS Games video, episode 329, will be debuting two Saturdays from now on June 29th where we're finally going to be taking a proper look at a DOS game which has appeared on ADG before, just not as an actual review. Yeah, Radix Beyond the Void wasn't the only such game, so be sure to stay tuned to see what I finally managed to get working through emulation. Thanks for watching everyone, and extra special thanks to everyone supporting me over on Patreon. If you'd also like to support the show directly and get some extra perks, then head on over to patreon.com slash K-A-S-I-C-K.